<laughs> Them actors is always in a hurry. You know, I envy you, Romeo. You're gonna go back to your taxi cab with a clear conscience and salvage the night's business. But I've got to stay to the bitter end because the record expects me to turn in a review on this stinkola. <laughs> well, this is one time I'm glad I'm not the great Anthony Woolrich, dramatic critic of a big New York newspaper. Well, thanks for inviting me instead of throwing your overcoat on the other seat. <laughs> Frankly, I think the overcoat would have had a better time. <laughs> you got something there. <laughs> hey, wait a what goes on over there? Oh, boy, oh, boy, it's a murder. Or maybe a suicide. Am I glad I come now? Come on, let's see what it's all about. The only murders that interest me are the ones on the stage that are neatly contrived. Oh, Tony, you're not going to pass this up. Why not? I'm a dramatic critic, not a leg man on a policeman. It's outside my province. Uh, listen, brother, I'm curious. All right, now break it up. Good evening, Mr. Lewis. Good evening, officer. Well, there's Corpus Delicti. Who's that bothering the body? Oh, that's just a hacky. He's got to stand near the theater, sir. Tell him to get out of there. What does he think this is, a wax museum? Yes, sir. Well, can't you listen to me for a minute, Tony? That was murder and a real screwy job. I copied the note pinned to the body just the way it was written. Now, get a look. Hello? Hello? No, yeah. No, no, no. Who's that? Oh, what difference has it made? Now, listen, Tony. This is what it says. It says, hang him from the yard arm and let him dance on air. And it's signed Captain Kidd. Imagine that. You imagine that. What? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Look, will you get lost? You care? I'm busy. Who was that? Oh, let's not go into that again. Now, look, I got to tell you something. Yeah, well, you that... listen to this just a minute. Claudia Moore, the star, did her best with a thankless role. She shows definite talent. Oh, and I'll let that Claudia look, wait. Look, will you get out of here? I'll meet you down at the cafe for a cup of coffee. Who's that coffee? Listen, just really want some information again, bud. You go up to the Moore house and get all the dope you can. And make it snappy or we'll miss this next edition like we did the Bulldog. Happened at the opening of Claudia Moore's play. She's the daughter of Cecil, the big shot actor, and the niece of Jonathan the Millionaire. The killer left a note. Get up the hot story, all right. But why don't you assign it to somebody who can get the stuff for you in a hurry? Matty, want to get back to your poker game? No, only this was theater stuff. Even that note sounds theatrical. Why don't you tell Tony about it? He knows the Moors. Well, he can dig up more stuff than I can anytime. Well, you go on down to headquarters and I'll tackle Tony with the Moors. Oh, hello, Tony. Just the man I want to see. What's this? A review of the play you saw tonight? Another stink old I guess. Well, Tony, I want you to help me out on a nice, juicy little murder. Just came in over the teletype. Tony, do you mean to tell me that you were at that opening tonight where that guy was murdered? Certainly. It's my business to attend openings. Don't you realize you had the jump on an exclusive story? Well, so what? I'm the dramatic critic on this newspaper, not the crime reporter. We were scooped by every newspaper in town. If he'd have phoned it in for the Bulldog edition, why, we'd have made that. Take it easy, take it easy, Peters. I'm not one of your leg men. I'm working for the owner of the paper. You won't be working for any newspaper at all if you don't recognize a good story when you bump into one. Well, what's such a good story about a murder to happen every day? Not like this one. The victim was Jonathan Moore. Who? Jonathan Moore, you big dope. The millionaire brother of the actor Cecil Moore and the uncle of Claudia Moore, the star of the play that you saw tonight. Now, look. You know all these actors, Tony. Why don't you go out to Cecil Moore's house and give me an exclusive angle on this yarn? Then maybe I wouldn't get my head cut off. Well, of course, I know the Moores, but I can't just barge in on them without an invitation. Holy mackerel, you're the most obstinate, stubborn excuse for a newspaper man I ever saw in my life. You're not going out to a social tea. You're going out to investigate a murder. No, I'm not going out and investigate anything. And I'm not going to sit here and listen to you ball me out because you want me to pull your chestnuts out of the fire. Good night. <gasps> you know, Romeo, it seems like everybody in town knows I was at that opening. And what a bawling out I got from Peters. So I'm not a good newspaper man, huh? I'm dim-witted, am I? Hey, why don't you show that editor you're an expert at murder? as well as the theater. I have a good mind to do it in self-defense. Atta boy. You know where the Moors live? Why, certainly. Let's get... Good 
evening, officer. Uh, just a minute, bud. Where are you going? Why, uh, I'm a personal friend of the Moors. Mm, that's what they all say. You ain't a newspaper man. Do I look like a newspaper man? Anything but. You look more like a lawyer or something. Oh, that's a funny thing. That's exactly who I am. Mr. Moore's lawyer. Hmm. I thought so. Okay. Go right in. Thank you. Uh, Miss Moore, is it true that your father... Oh, uh, good evening, Miss Moore. Well, who let you in here? I, uh, I'm an intimate friend of the family. I came over to see if I could help. Who are you? I'm Lieutenant Walsh of the Homicide Squad. Well, Miss Moore, I guess I'll have to ask your father. Why don't you let her alone? Can't you see she's on the verge of a breakdown? I'm here to solve a murder. Well, uh, look, old man, why not come back some other time? You know, after the shock has worn off. Now, listen, young fellow. I don't need any advice from you. I'm here on police business. Understand? And we don't like anybody interfering with police business. Remember that. I'll talk to your father later, Miss Moore. Good night. Well, what a nasty individual he turned out to be. Would you mind telling me who you are? I heard you say you were a friend of the family, but I don't know you. I'm uh, Tony Woolrich of the record. I know your father well. Oh, yes. Well, please sit down. Thank you. I uh, must say that makeup you wore tonight didn't do you justice. Then you were at... Yes, I was there when it all happened. To think that it had to happen tonight at the opening. Oh, please let me extend my sympathies. Uh, your father knows all about it, of course. I don't know. He should be home now. But then he often stays at the theater after the performance. You know, he owns the Gotham. Oh, yes. Uh, probably has a lot of details to attend to. But frankly, I, I, I'm worried about his being late tonight. Hello. Hello, Mr. Moore. My poor child. Father, the police have just been here. Yes, dear, I know. I, I've just come from headquarters. This is a terrible thing. I was at the opening, and I thought maybe I could help. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Mr. Woolrich, and thank you so much for coming. Were you told of your brother's death immediately? Yes, the police were at my theater, and they asked me to go to headquarters right after the performance. But, frankly, I... I couldn't finish the performance. Well, I don't blame you. Have you any theories as to what might have happened? No, it was all a great shock to me. You and your brother were very close, weren't you? Yes, we were very fond of each other. Well, I guess I'd better run along. You'll let me know if I can help. Of course. Thank you so much for coming. It's all right. Good night. Good night. This is Tony Woolrich. Who? Oh, hello, Peters. Say, what the devil is the idea of calling me at this hour? What, another murder? Well, what do I care? You've got a whole staff of reporters, some of them good, too. But listen, Tony, this does concern you. The night watchman of a big plant in the Bronx was murdered. Do you mean to tell me you called me in the middle of the night to tell me a watchman was killed? Are you crazy? No, I'm not crazy, but I think the guy that murdered the watchman is. He had on a costume, and he... Tried to burn down the watchman's garage. Yeah, and he also left one of those screwy notes. Oh, well, that's different. Wait a minute. What's the address? Oh, hello, boys. Hello, hello Tony. Tony. Uh, Did I miss anything? Not much, Tony. The police have thrown a cordon around all the subways. And they expect an arrest within 24 hours. Who is this guy? That is not a guy. That is a critic on a New York record. So, you are a newspaper man. What's the idea of posing a friend of the Moors? I'm also a friend of the Moors. And now that you've penetrated my disguise, may I look at that note? Yeah, it's been dusted for prints. Go ahead. Burn, roam, burn while I laugh. Nero. That's from a play. The third act of The Mad Fiddler. Written about 1850. <laughs> now I suppose you're going to tell me the murderer was an actor. Could be. I still think he was a lunatic. Oh, that could be too. But I think that you will find there's a definite connection between the two costume murders and the theater. Listen, Woolrich. You stick to reviewing burlicue shows, and I'll stick to police work. Very good, Lieutenant. Is Mrs. Carney around? In there. Thank you. That'll be all, boys. <laughs> Why, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Carney. I'm Tony Woolrich of the record. <laughs> I happen to be at the scene of the other murder, so naturally I'm interested in this one. Would you mind answering a few questions? <laughs> I told the police all I know. Well, you see, the fact that both murders were committed in costume makes me feel there's a connection. 
Did your husband know Jonathan Moore? Yes, he did. Many years ago. My husband was a stage electrician. That's very interesting. Do you remember just exactly when your husband first met Jonathan? <laughs> Not exactly. He was hired when Cecil Moore started his own repertoire company. About 25 years ago. That's just what I wanted to know. Thank you very much, Mrs. Carney. <laughs> You'll, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Good morning. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm awfully glad you could come. I wanted to talk to you. Do sit down. Thank you. Oh, I see you've been reading my review. Yes, it's a little harsh on the play. I'm afraid the play wasn't very good. I guess you're right. It closes tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the other notices were bad, too. In fact, not as kind as yours. You know, um, Father said some very nice things about you last night. He's very fond of you. I think a great deal of him. Mr. Woolrich, the reason I asked you to come over is I have a very special request to make. Naturally, you have the right to refuse. I'll be glad to do anything I can. I'm worried about Father, very worried. He's ill and he's been behaving strangely lately. Oh, really? How strangely? Well, um, he seems to suffer from lapses of memory. But anyway, I want him to quit the stage and really retire. It's not a question of money anymore. Has it ever been? Well, uh, frankly, Father's had his financial reverses, as of all actor managers. Mm -hmm. Then your uh, uncle's estate will come in handy. Well, frankly, yes, but let's not discuss it. I want you to ask Father to leave the stage. Well, won't he resent that? His play's a hit. I know, but it's worth trying, and it might save his life. Is he that ill? It's not only that. I have a terrible premonition that he'll be killed next, unless we do something to prevent it. Well, frankly, I have the same hunch. Has anything happened that makes you think he might be murdered? Yes. There's been a strange figure lurking around our house lately. Oh? How is he dressed? It's not a man, it's a woman. A woman? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I'm glad you told me this. I'll look into it right away. And about Father. I'll talk to him, too. Well, that's very kind of you. I hope I haven't presumed a great deal. <laughs> Not at all. Now, may I be presumptuous for a moment? Yes. Are you going to marry John Garraby? The columns are full of it. I haven't quite made up my mind. Why? Well, I haven't quite made up my mind why I ask you. That's a strange question. Maybe, but it's not exactly an idle question. No? No. You see, I've sort of appointed myself guardian of the Moors. Well, a critic is guardian of an active family. That's the millennium. Or perhaps it sounds like I'm interested. Oh, well, uh, well that's very kind of you, but uh, now if you'll excuse me, I have a very busy day. I, I have lots of things to do. Of course. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming. Not at all. I'll keep in touch with you. Well, goodbye. Bye. Find out. I'll tell her. Well, what do we do now? Wait. She was dressed for the street and will probably be leaving any minute. I know it's a boorish thing to do, but I'd like to follow her. Look, all detectives are boorish. Don't let that worry you. There she is now. Okay, don't lose her. Don't worry. I've been out with real detectives. Mm -hmm. Well, don't lose her. she'd be doing going in a costume shop. Well, Moore's play is a costume play. Say, maybe you've got a thought there. See, she left it in the shop. I've got 
got to find out what's in that bundle. The idea is to get the bundle first. Yeah. Look, Romeo, you go in and tell him that Miss Moore wants that bundle back. Tell him it's a costume. Well, I hope it's a costume. Tell him she forgot something. we will go for that. Well, sure, she might send a taxi driver for it. Yeah. Okay, I'll try. Good morning, Miss Moore. Have you seen Robert? Yes, I believe he's right over there. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, good morning, Miss Moore. Tell Father I'm having the costume mended. Parent says he's bringing it back tonight. Good. Your father will be relieved. He doesn't want a word about the accident to get out. That's why he sent you with the costume. I understand. No one else needs to know. I'll see you before I leave. Well, what do you know a pirate's outfit? You, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. Yes, and there's a hole in it, too. And that's a bullet hole. Yeah, yeah. somebody took a shot at somebody. Yeah, somebody did. You remember that actor that brushed by us at the opening last night seemed to be in a hurry? Yeah, and he had on a parent's outfit, just like that. Say, what was that note left on Jonathan Moore's body? Something about pirates, wasn't it? And signed by Captain Kidd, remember? Sure I remember. I got it right here, just the way I copied it. Hang him from the yard arm and let him dance on air. That's from a play. It's just like the note Nero left. And the play was called Captain Kidd. Yes, sir, to quote the bard, the play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Hamlet, act two, scene two. Romeo, you was down. Hey, I ain't called Romeo for nothing. That one, my real name's Egbert Egelhofer. Egbert what? Egbert Egelhofer. I got the moniker of Romeo when I started spouting Shakespeare at the boys. I was brought up on Shakespeare. Just like the Bible. I haven't got time to listen to your biography, you Egbert. Am I going to have trouble with you? Look, take this back to Monsieur Perron and tell him it's more found what you wanted. Then we're going to the Gotham Theater and do a little investigating. Hello, Mike. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Walrich. Anything I can do for you? No, I just want to browse around backstage a bit. You're getting quite a run here, aren't you? Yes, it's a fine play. We'll have a long run. And if Mr. Moore's health holds out. Yes, I've heard he isn't too good. What seems to be the trouble, Mike? This is between you and me. I won't print a word of it. Oh, well, he has attacks. Kind of queer and sudden-like. Last night he was fine for two acts, then he collapsed. And Kim Wells, his understudy, had to go on for him. Really? Did they call a doctor? No, Roberts. Mr. Moore's dresser, he drove him home. Home? Last night? Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Well, it's too bad. He's a fine actor. I suppose his brother's death had something to do with it. I don't think he knew about it then. Well, I'll go in and mum's the word. Oh, uh, one other little thing, Mike. And this is strictly between you and me. Was there a shooting accident here last night? No. Not that I know of. I want to talk about her. See you later. Hello, Mr. Thomas. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Woolrich. Come to look this over again? Yes, I'm thinking about writing a story on the interesting period props you have here. A stage manager, do you have charge of them? Oh, no. That's in Joe's department. He's the property man. I'll send him over to you. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Collins said you wanted to talk to me. Oh, yes. Uh, you're in charge of properties. Yes. You've got some interesting props here. Yes, sir. Authentic, too. We got the furniture from the museum. How about the dueling pistols? Do you have charge of those, too? No, sir. They belong to Mr. Moore. They're real antiques. Roberts' dresser takes care of them. I see. 
How does it happen that a real bullet was used in one of them last night? I don't know. It must have been a mistake. Don't you load them with blanks? Yes, sir. They were loaded with blanks. I'll swear to that. Then how did that real bullet get in one of them? I don't know. You better talk to Mr. Thomas about it, sir. I will. Thanks for the information. Oh, did you see Joe? Yes. Thomas, I know that an accident happened here last night, and there's no use your denying it. Now, I won't print anything you tell me, but I would like to hear about it. Mr. Moore asked us not to talk about it. Did someone try and kill Caraby? It looks that way, yes. One of the pistols had a real bullet in it. How did it get there? I haven't the slightest idea. We used nothing but blanks. Who hands the pistols to the dealers in that scene? I missed it. Tim Wells. He plays the referee. Don't you think that the gun loaded with the real bullet was intended for Caraby, so he could fire it more? Well, frankly, yes. When I learned that Mr. Moore's brother had been killed, I figured someone had it in for the entire family. But, oh, here's Miss Moore now. Let's not discuss it in front of her. Oh, hello, Miss Moore. Hello, have you come to see Father? Well, yes, I figured now was as good a time as any. He's very much upset today. Oh, I'll pick the psychological moment to talk to him about retiring. Perhaps you'd better not force the issue. Don't tell me you're losing heart. Frankly, I'd rather not do it. No, I want you to talk to him, but only as you said at the psychological moment. Leave it to me. How about having dinner with me tonight? No, not tonight. I have a date. But ask me again. Bye. Hi, Romeo. Hi. I thought you said she wanted you to talk to her father. That's right, she did. Well, she better make up her mind. She's sure acting suspicious. Think so? <laughs> you would, too. If you weren't so busy gazing into a peepers all the time. <laughs> I thought you was hard-boiled. Only the shell, Romeo. Underneath, I'm as soft as a two-minute egg. <laughs> well, you better harden up, chum, because you'll never beat that guy's time. Get a load. Charming couple, aren't they, Mr. Woolridge? Too bad Mr. Moore doesn't approve. Oh, doesn't he? No, Mr. Moore prefers that his daughter marry outside the profession. He has good reason. Yes, undoubtedly he has. Is Mr. Moore available now? I'd like to talk to him in a few minutes. He's in his dressing room now. Thank you. I'll be right back. No. Look, you know, I take him here, I take him there, I go from, I come from. I... <laughs> You're not interested, are you? Not at all. Come in. Ah, Mr. Woolridge, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Mr. Moore, I know I'm stepping out of character a bit, but I'm interested in the murder of your brother and Peter Carney. Now it's, well, it's more than a newspaper man's curiosity. I have a feeling that there's something progressively sinister behind those murders, and that perhaps you yourself might be in danger. But I have no enemies. Did your brother have enemies? Well, a businessman sometimes makes enemies. You uh, knew, of course, that Peter Carney was at one time your company electrician. Was he? I'd forgot. Well, he was. Mrs. Carney told me. Mr. Moore, something happened when you were running that old Moore repertoire company. Something that had repercussions today. What was it? I can't imagine. It was a very successful company. That was because Jonathan ran it. He had a very good head for business. But he ran afoul of someone. Perhaps. But not in my company. We were very happy together. On stage, Mr. Moore. Excuse me, Mr. Goodrich. Of course. We'll have another talk. You were in there a long time. What'd you find out? Well, it seems that the old Moore repertoire company is the key to everything. Take me to the record. Take me here. Take me there. All right, let's go. looking for that exclusive on the Moore murder? In a manner of speaking. Well, you can relax. The cops just arrested the murderer. They have? Who is it? A lunatic. Escaped from an asylum up the river. He confessed to both the Carney and the Moore murders. Oh, he did, huh? Did the police compare his handwriting with that on the notes? Well, I don't know. I guess they did. Anyway, the case is closed. Sorry I jumped on you like that, old man. That's all right, Peters. You know, um, 
Getting on a confession out of a lunatic is probably the worst thing in the world. You mean you don't believe he's the killer? Well, I don't know, but uh, I doubt if the police are on the right track. Hello, Mike. Hello, Mr. Woolridge. Say, uh, Mike, you've been around the theater a long time, haven't you? Man and boy for 35 years. Knew many of the old-timers, too, didn't Oh, you? I've seen them all. The Drews, the Barrymores, Maud Adams, the Southern. Oh, I've seen all the great ones. Here's a program from the old Moore Repertoire Company. You recognize any of the names? Sure. There's old Tim Wells. That's Mr. Moore's understudy now. And Roberts. He was with the troupe. Anyone else? Yeah, I know that lady. Janet Hill. Hmm. I didn't know she was with Moore. When's a boarding house down on West 39th Street? Mostly theatrical people. Oh, she's a fine lady. Do you uh, know the exact... Sure. Her name's Miss Buchanan now. Half a block west of 8th on the north side of the street. You can't miss it. It's the only nicely kept brownstone house in the block. Thanks, Mike. You've been a great help. Good afternoon. You're uh, Mrs. Buchanan? Yes. Well, I'm Tony Woolrich of the record. Oh, yes. How nice of you to visit us. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. I was just about to fix tea. Will you join me? No, thanks, Mrs. Buchanan. I'll uh, come right to the point. Weren't you formerly with the old Moore Repertoire Company? Yes, I was. And you appeared in Captain Kidd and several of the other historical plays, didn't you? Yes. I was the leading lady. But why all the questions? Are you writing an article about old-timers? No, I'm not, Mrs. Buchanan. It's something much more serious. I'm investigating two murders. Oh. The murder of Jonathan Moore and Peter Carney. You knew them both, didn't you? You'd better answer that question, Mrs. Buchanan. I don't see what right you have to question me like that. I'm not questioning you for idle curiosity. If you want to know the truth, I'm here ahead of the police. I'm working with them on the murders. That still doesn't give you the right to ask me personal questions. Would you rather the police ask them? What did you want to know? You did know Jonathan Moore and Peter Kearney. Yes. What have you been doing around Cecil Moore's house lately? What makes you think it was me? Because I know you're concerned with the Moores. How directly, I don't know as yet. You're right. I am greatly concerned with the Moores. You see, Claudia Moore is my daughter. Your daughter? But she doesn't know that I'm her mother. I left her and Cecil when she was just a baby. And the circumstances were, well, unfortunate. Cecil divorced me. I've been trying to get up courage to, to talk to Claudia. But every time I see her, I lose heart. Why have you waited so long to make a decision? I never would have attempted to see them if it hadn't been for the murder of Jonathan. Now I feel that both he and Claudia are in danger. Oh, maybe I'm just imagining things. No, you feel just exactly the way I feel, Mrs. Buchanan. That's why we've got to work together to help them. Help them? How? To guard against that danger. I, too, feel that after Jonathan, possibly Claudia or Cecil might be next. Oh, no. But you know that's true. Why were they killed? I certainly wouldn't know about that. Take a look at this, Mrs. Buchanan. It lists Jonathan Moore as company manager and Peter Kearney as chief electrician. Doesn't that suggest something to you? Why were they killed? What could have happened those many years ago? Mr. Woolridge, you're digging into the past like a ghoul. Why do you insist upon making me talk about things that are better forgotten? Because you know yourself there's a killer loose who was bent on wiping out all the Moors, possibly everyone on this program. But in the paper, it said that the police had arrested someone. No, the police, unfortunately, they aren't anywhere near the truth. Do you feel that you are? If you tell me what happened in the Moore Repertoire Company 25 years ago. Well, it, it began when I joined the company as Angelou. Both Cecil and Jonathan began to show an interest. But I was in love with one of the actors. Henry Winters was his name then. Suddenly one day, Henry disappeared into thin air. I was distracted. I even went to the police, but not a trace of him was found. And so you married Cecil. Why did you pick Cecil? Frankly, because I distrusted Jonathan. 
I always felt he had something to do with Henry's disappearance. Your marriage didn't work out. No. I guess I was too much in love with Henry. Well, I finally heard from him again. He was in Boston, playing under another name. I finally married him under his real name, Buchanan. Are you still married to him? No, I, I divorced him many years ago. He's dead now. He died in an asylum. His effects were sent to me. You know, he changed considerably after our marriage. He was moody and extremely jealous. Something seemed to be happening to his mind. I left him in order to save my own sanity. I understand. Mrs. Buchanan, would you do me a favor and come to the Gotham Theater with me? But why? To see if you recognize any of the other people who might have been with the old Moore Repertoire Company. Good evening, Mike. Why, good evening, Mr. Walrich. Well, if that isn't Mrs. Buchanan. How do you do? Mike, we want to look around backstage a few minutes. Certainly, Mr. Woolrich. Will you excuse me, please? Sure. Look around and let me know if you recognize anyone. How about him? No. Him? No, I never saw him before. That man over there looks like Roberts. Cecil's dresser. That's right, that is Roberts. Moore's had him with him all these years. How about him? No. How about that actor over there? It's rather difficult to tell in that wig and costume, but... Yes. I believe it is Tim Wells. He was with the company, too. That's right, that's Wells. He's Moore's understudy now. Cecil, I do hope he doesn't see me. He won't. He's on pretty soon. How about him? Now look around at the crew and the rest of the cast. There's Claudia. Don't you think we'd better be going? Don't you recognize anyone else? No. You never saw any of the cast before? No, I'm certain of that. All right, we'll go. I'm sorry I was so persistent, but it's important. Oh, I understand. Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Stay here. Say, Joe, did anyone just pass you? No, what happened? Somebody took a shot at me. Glad they missed you. Oh, Roberts, did you hear a shot? A shot? Why, no, not since the jeweling scene. Where were we just a minute ago? Standing in the wings. I better go now. Oh, Thomas. Yes, Mr. Rodriguez. Did anyone just run backstage? No, I didn't see anyone. Where are Tim Wells and John Caraby right now? Well, just on the other side. He's got a bit in this scene. He's waiting to go on. Caraby should be in his dressing room. Is Mr. Moore in his dressing room? I know. Mr. Moore is right there on the stage. Oh. What's all the excitement about? Somebody took a shot at me. You're just imagining things. Did anyone go out the door? No. No one. Where were you a few minutes ago, Mike? Why, that is, uh... Well, I just went down to the basement to brew myself a cup of coffee. Yeah. Please don't give me away, will you? No, I won't, but did anyone pass you down there? No, I got a little cubby hole down there. I did hear some footsteps, though. Who was it? Well, I, I don't know. I didn't see them. Oh, here we are. Well, I must say somebody tried to kill us. A half a foot lower and... I can't understand why anyone would want to shoot it up. Well, I can. And I'd better take you home right away. Good night, Mike. Good night. Romeo, I'll take Mrs. Buchanan home and then come back for me, will you? Right. Now, don't go out until you hear from me. I won't. Tony. I'm ready to talk to your father now. Is he alone? He's gone. Gone? 
Yes, he became ill after the last scene. Wells is finishing for him. Oh, that's too bad. I'm just gathering up some things for him now. Suppose you let me take you home. My cab ought to be back in a few minutes. That's very kind of you, Tony. Thanks. Claudia, did you know there was another shooting here tonight? No, was somebody hurt? No, but the bullet almost had my name on it. But why would anybody want to kill you? I'm not sure the bullet was meant for me. Do you think it was meant for my father? Could be. Can't the police do something? Well, they made an arrest, but it's obviously not the right person. Oh. Well, there's more, is Hey, look, I'm near a fire plug. Skip it. Take me to Miss Moore. I'm with fast. Why don't you take it easy? I'll work cheaper. Guy to leave the country. I'm terribly worried. I'm sure your father's all right. Anyway, I'm glad you're both here. Ah, uh -huh. don't worry, Tetch. Uh -huh. I mean, Miss Moore, everything's going to be all right. Hey, Tony, this ain't more. It's some other guy. Now, take it easy. Here's one of them screwy notes. Now watch the fingerprints. It says, when I returned from Elba, I swore I would kill my enemies. Napoleon. Put it back. Hey. Yeah. Get a load of this. Identification card. This shows he was Jim Olson, employed in the shipyards, a carpenter. Now, what do you suppose he did to the Phantom Killer? <laughs> look, you're the smart guy. I drive the cab. Oh, look, Walsh, we've been telling you the truth, and you've had us here all night. Now, why can't we go home? At least let Miss Moore get some sleep. I'll let you all go, and I get through with you. The coroner just sent this over, Lieutenant. Thanks. The coroner says that Olson was dead for several hours before you found him. Well, that's logical enough. Maybe the killer brought him over here. Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe as a warning. To whom? To Miss Moore. Is there any reason why the murderer should warn you, Miss Moore? Well, not that I know of. Well, good evening. Well, Mr. Moore, it's about time you got here. Is anything wrong? Where have you been since you left the theater? I... I visited some friends. I thought you took sick and Roberts brought you home. I felt better in the cab and had Roberts drop me off at a friend's house. Yeah? Who's the friend? Mrs. Buchanan. Well, you better have an airtight alibi. Why? Because there's been a murder committed right here in your apartment. A murder? Here? You heard me. You're quite a hero today, Tony. Yeah, Walsh is going to love that part about me finding the body. <laughs> can I freshen up your coffee, Jim? This time you can have it without cream or without milk. Now, just take your choice. <laughs> this time we'll take it without the ice cracks. What a dame. She slaps the cabbie. You know, Romeo, I've been thinking. Those murders didn't have to be committed by a man. A woman could have worn those costumes just as well. You got something there. I've been thinking, too. You know, old man Moore and his daughter fell into a considerable piece of change when Jonathan was bumped off. And the paper says he died without leaving the will. Well, I don't think Cecil Moore needed money that badly. Anyway, I still think my original hunch is right. Somebody's trying to knock off the whole Moore family. Maybe. Hey, how about the John Carradine? You know, if anybody married into the Moore family and the whole family was knocked off, he'd come into all the moolah himself. Yeah, that's true. Something about Caribbean I don't like. Oh, yeah. Couldn't be the way he hangs around Claudia, huh? <laughs> well, partly. Let's go to the theater. I got an idea. <laughs> Here we go again. I don't think Walsh is going to like this, but I've got a curious mind. <laughs> got a curious mind, too. Hey, what are we here for, anyway? We're going to take a peek in Caribbean's dressing room. separate. I'll go with you. No. 
All right. my taxi business? Well, Rich, I thought I told you to stay out of police business. Well, 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 it isn't our fault. Somebody dropped a sandbag on us. What is this, another brainstorm? No, honest, honest. They, they took a shot, too. Was it you? Listen, if I took a shot, I wouldn't have missed. What are you guys doing down here? Well, we were just kind of looking around, kind of... I thought I told... What's the matter? Somebody's coming along that drop. Well, gentlemen. Well, Miss Moore, this looks like old home week. I was just going into my father's dressing room. He asked me to get some things for him, if you don't mind. Now, that's just fine. And we'll go with you. Hmm. Uh, your hat, Lieutenant. Uh. Come in. Why, Miss Moore, I thought your father wanted you to get something. Well, I guess I... That's right, Lieutenant. I left my script here. Claudia didn't know I was going to be downtown anyway. Well, now that you're here, how about rehearsing with me? I need to brush up on some lines. Uh, would you care to watch? No, thank you. I've got to be gone. All right, goodbye. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Romeo, you're gonna do a little singing. Oh, he can't sing a note, Lieutenant. He's tone deaf. Now me, I can... You can get me a cup of coffee. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. You and Woolrich have been up to a lot of shenanigans, and we want to know about them. I think you better ask Tony. Sure, you ought to ask Tony. He knows all about them murders. Oh, he does, does he? How do you know that? Oh, him and Romer are always talking about them. Oh! All right, if you want her to shut up, suppose you talk. What do you know about Mrs. Buchanan? Nothing. Why, Romeo! I'll get your coffee right away. Do I have to remind you that you're getting your license from the police department? Huh. Then what's Woolrich got on these murders that we ain't got? I still think you ought to ask Tony. We'll get to him. But he ain't operating a cab, see? And maybe you won't be either. All right, let's go. Now, wait a minute. All I know about Mrs. Buchanan is she operates a ham's board mouse. Somebody took a shot at her. Tony's got the bullet. So now he's a ballistic expert, too, eh? What else? Well, Tony's got some old theater programs with her name in them. That's all I can tell you, honest. Sure that's all you know? Sure, I'm sure. And Tony ain't gonna like my telling you either. We'll see about that. Well, here's everything I've got. Notice this bullet. It's a ball. Propelled by an old-fashioned pistol, no doubt. And such a pistol is being used every day at the Gotham Theater. Twice on matinee days. These programs were available for anyone who wanted to look at them. They're playbills from the old Moore Repertoire Company. And our three murder victims are on them. So that's the connection. Moore played the star part in each one. Captain Kidd, Nero, and Napoleon. Well, that settles it. What? I'm going to swear out a warrant for Moore's arrest right away. Well, I admit it looks bad for Moore, but I've got a hunch that he'll be the next victim instead of being the killer. <laughs> well, really, that's good. Listen, Tony, I like everything you've done for me, but uh, you've got the wrong steer on Moore. Look, Walsh, suppose Moore did have a reason to kill his brother. Money. That's a very good motive. But why should he kill Jim Olson and Peter Carney, two hard-working, innocent men? Well, there's only one answer to that. I guess Moore's plain nuts. Why, you can't get away with a statement like that. Your last suspect was nuts, and that's exactly what he turned out to be. An escaped lunatic. You can't pen that same label on Cecil Moore and get away with it. 
But you yourself said no sane man could have committed those murders. Yes, but this man's cunning. He's posing as a sane man and getting away with it. Thanks. Where does that leave us? With a suspect? Where are you going to find him? By using Cecil Moore as bait. You mean as bait to catch the murderer? What else? Why, Moore's been playing in the theater for months. He's been using himself for bait if the killer was after him. That's right. It's probably only a matter of time before the killer strikes at Moore. But I've got a different idea. If a pattern were followed deliberately, the killer might rise to the bait, especially if it were made easy for him. Oh, uh, make it easy for the murderer to kill Moore. Exactly. Look, Walsh, time and place mean something to that killer. Costume also means something. That's what I mean by the murderer's following a pattern. Let's put Moore on a play where the killer can get at him. Julius Caesar, for instance. That's one of Moore's favorite roles. Why the killer would give anything, take any chance to play Brutus to that Caesar. But you can't kill a man to catch a murderer. Have you gone nuts, too? I think I know how it can be done. Suppose I work it out tonight and give you all the details in the morning. Okay. But it's dangerous to leave a man like Moore loose. Just a kidding, I am worried. Well, I don't see why. Everything's going along smoothly. Oh, sure. The benefit's going along okay. I just came from the theater, and there's enough actors down there to fill the Metropolitan Opera House, and they all want to play Brutus. Supposing we don't get the right Brutus. That's a chance we'll have to take. But I'll lay odds that the right Brutus will show up, and with the dagger. And supposing that dagger hits more in the throat, or some place that's not protected by that steel vest. That's another chance we'll have to take. You mean... More will have to take. Listen, Tony, I don't like that anyway. Why, if anything happens, it means my badge. We just can't allow anything to go wrong. That's all right for you to say. You'll still be the dramatic critic of the record. And I'll be pounding a beat out in Flatbush. <laughs> Flatbush isn't so bad. I was there once for a tryout. Come on, Lieutenant. Let's go get a drink. You look like you need one. No, Tony, I've got too much in my mind. I talked to Mrs. Buchanan again. She gave Moore another alibi. She says he visited her the night Jonathan was killed. Seems she sent for him. Didn't say why. Hmm, that doesn't sound too good. They're hiding something, both of them. I had her room searched. Well, what we found, I didn't like. Different costume. Well, she's an actress. But these were men's costumes. Brother, we'd better go get that drink. Now, Sunday night during the show, we'll both be dressed as Roman senators. You over there and me over here. Oh, you're going to turn me into a ham, eh? One turn ought to do it. There you are. Oh, hello, Mr. Woolridge. Oh, the tone of voice, she wants something. No, I wasn't talking to you. I talked to Mr. Moore about you playing a bit, Ginger, and he said it would be all right. Oh, thank you, Mr. Woolridge. I know it. Let's see now. Uh, oh, yes, he said you could play a slave girl. Could I? Would I have a line? Certainly. You say Cassius waits without sire. Cassius waits without sire. Gee! Now you watch Mr. Thomas, the stage manager, and when he gives you the cue, you walk on stage and say your line. Savvy? Sure. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Woolrich. I was wanted to play a part with Cecil Moore. Oh, wait till I tell the other girls. I can hardly wait. <laughs> well, Tony, what do you know about that? The Brutus didn't show up for the rehearsals. The stage manager just told me. Well, he must have smelled a rat. Who's taking his place? I don't know yet. But if Brutus got leery, what's the use of going through with this? Got to go through with it. I still think somebody will take a stab at Moore, and I'm not punning. The more I think of it, the plainer I see Flatbush. You know, Sam, that's the first nervous detective I ever saw, especially Walsh. That certainly shakes your faith in humanity. Well, wait till you watch a dramatic critic with a nervous breakdown. I'm going to see more. Yeah. She's gonna, uh, he's gonna play, uh, 
I was just telling Mr. Moore about Brutus taking a powder. Well, that's fine. Then I won't have to wear this bulletproof vest. Oh, yes, you will. Yes, but it's got to be very uncomfortable. You seem to forget this killer is nobody's fool. He's still at large after three sensational murders. That means he's cunning. I wouldn't advise any of us to drop our guard. Maybe, but I still have a hunch that he took a powder. Come in. Look at this. I just tore it down from outside the theater. He oh. took a powder, did he? Why, the smart Alec. Let me see that. Please. And that isn't all. Go out and look at that call board. Say, Walsh, does that handwriting look familiar to you? I don't know. I'm not a handwriting expert. Well, I'm no expert either, but that certainly looks like the handwriting on those death notes. Ah! Oh. Oh. I saw the word death on it. Some, uh, some practical joker, Claudia. No, Tony. Father's in danger. I know it. Now, Miss Moore, everybody on the stage is being watched, so you just take it easy. I have a feeling that there's something going on. Something I don't know about. What is it, Tony? Well, it's just an experiment, and I can't say anything about it. But I don't like all this secrecy, Tony, especially if it concerns Father. Trust me. You can, you know. Yes, I know. You've been wonderful about everything, Tony. Well, if nothing else, I've accomplished one thing. What's that? I've got you calling me Tony. Everybody on stage! I guess that means you, too. Yes, darn it. Well, gentlemen, shall we begin? Yes, sir. All right, everybody. Get ready. When I yell trumpets, the trumpeters will sound a flourish. That's the start of the scene. Hey, Tony, what do you know about that? Moore's understudy is going to play Brutus. Timothy Wells? Yeah, that's the fellow. Well, that doesn't mean anything. In this scene, all the senators have knives. Brutus doesn't have to actually do the stabbing. After all the advertising you did for a Brutus? That was just to come on. The killer might strike through Brutus, he might strike through Caskey or Cassius or any of the other assassins in the scene. We'll soon know. Now listen, you fellas. You've got to have eyes in the back of your head for a job like this. Anything that you see that's suspicious, why, just pounce on it. Understand? Right. All right, do you remember your lines? Cassius waits without, sire. The trouble is, I always want to say, without what? Oh, it's them bum gags that's got you. Why don't you forget them? I'll try. Sound your trumpets. Nor heaven nor earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice has Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help, ho! They murder Caesar! Mr. Moore certainly put on a lot of amateurs this performance. The taxi driver, that waitress, the newspaper man. Well, it's only a benefit. And you know how Mr. Moore feels about Woolrich and the power of the press. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. Seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Caesar, beware of Brutus. Take heed of Cassius. Come not near Casca. Have an eye to Cinna. Trust not Trebonius. Well, that Caesar really had a lot of enemies. Your boy's really on his spot. Ginger, you're on next. Oh, my, what's my line? Why, Cassius waits without, sire. Oh, wait a minute, let me practice. Um, the carriage waits without. No, no, no. Oh, no, you're too late now. The rest of you on stage. Yet in the number, I do know but one that unassailable holds on his rank, unshaped of motion, and that I am he. Let me a little show it, even in this, that I was constant Simba should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. O oh, Caesar! Hence, wilt thou lift up Olympus? Great Caesar. Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak of hands for me. Uh, uh, speak of hands for me. Then fall, Caesar. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thomas, the vice stage manager. It's Thomas, all right. And he's also Henry Buchanan, the only man with a motive for the murders. But why would Thomas want to kill my brother? Well, you see, Jonathan, thinking he could marry Janet, had Buchanan shanghaied by the other two men. But Janet married you instead. Well, he never told me anything about being shanghaied. No, he brooded about it alone. He was cunning, changed his appearance and struck three times. It's your ex-husband, all right, with an expert facelifting and hair dyeing job. Yes, but I never would have recognized him. No, he made sure you wouldn't recognize him. He's our man, all right. He would have struck again tonight if it hadn't been for you, Tony. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you're safe, dear. I didn't dare tell you where I was and until these awful murders happened. I'm glad you're back, Janet. I just remembered my line. It's the Cassius Waste Without, sire. Great. But a little late. <laughs> <laughs>